Hello. Welcome to Monolithic Microwave Integrated Circuits, Design Strategies for First-Time Success with Ali Darwish. I'm Mike Hamilton, your host for this IEEE Microwave Theory and Technique Society webcast, which is sponsored by National Instruments. Before we start, I'll mention a few housekeeping items. First, this presentation will be archived. We'll send all registrants an email when the archived webinar goes up so you can revisit it or share it with your colleagues. Second, we encourage questions. We'll answer them after the talk, but you can submit them at any time during the discussion. Enter your question in the Q&A box on the left side of the webcast window, and don't forget to click Submit. Third, some words about the interface. You can enlarge slides by clicking on the rectangle at the top right of the slide area. You can also go into full screen mode if you desire. Refresh or reload the current page if you encounter problems. If you're listening over your computer speakers, you can adjust the media player volume. Remember, you may also need to adjust your system's master volume. The icons at the bottom of the webinar window include a resource list. Clicking that link will start the process to download copies of the slides that will be presented today. Now let's introduce our speaker. Ali Darwish received his PhD degree from Massachusetts Institute of Technology in Cambridge, Massachusetts in 1996. In 1990, he joined ComSat Laboratories where he conducted the experimental work on his MS thesis. In 1997, he co-founded Amcom Communications Incorporated, a leading supplier of high-power microwave integrated circuits. At Amcom Communications, he served as a vice president of product development where he designed and commercialized several product lines. In May of 2003, he joined a U.S. government research lab where he conducted research on wideband gap materials, including GAN, thermal analysis of active devices, and novel MIMIC concepts. Dr. Darwish designed several state-of-the-art monolithic microwave integrated circuits, including an X-band low phase noise oscillator, GAN millimeter wave power amplifiers, SIGI millimeter wave amplifiers, broadband high power amplifiers in the L, S, X, K, U, and K, A band, mixers, digital attenuators, and phase shifters. Dr. Darwish is an associate editor of IEEE Microwave Magazine, an adjunct faculty member with John Hopkins University, and instructor with Besser Associates, Associates Incorporated. Dr. Darwish is an IEEE senior member and an active member of the MTT Society. His areas of expertise include novel techniques in millimeter wave mimics in GAN and gas, subterahertz communications, and reliability and thermal characterization of mimics. He has published over 100 journal and conference papers. So now it's my pleasure to turn the virtual podium over to Dr. Darwish for monolithic microwave integrated circuits, design strategies for first-time success. Ali? Thank you very much, Mike, and welcome, everyone. Thank you for attending. And uh, in the short time that we have um, during um, uh, the next hour or so, we're going to go over some of the important points to consider when designing a mimic. So here is an outline uh, of the talk. Uh, we'll talk about some of the benefits and limitations of mimic um, designs. Uh, we'll talk about active uh, device modeling. Think about the temperature, and uh, junction temperature and lifetime of mimics as well as discuss uh, passive components and preventing uh, oscillations. Under the advantages and limitations, um, we'll go quickly over uh, issues that pertain to size, price, and some of the technologies available. And when we discuss the uh, active device modeling, uh, we'll talk about why do we model uh, anything, uh, any of the devices in the first place, talk about small and large signal modeling, and some of the pitfalls uh, of modeling. For the lifetime of mimics, we'll talk about um, the relationship between the channel temperature or the junction temperature and the expected uh, reliability of the mimic parts and the concept of thermal resistance and how to calculate it. So first, um, just as an intro, um, the key word in the uh, MIMIC is the integrated piece uh, because we can build hybrid circuits uh, where we have a printed circuit board and we install discrete components. Um, we can install transistors, um, capacitors, inductors, and so on. Uh, one of, so in the picture is on the left you see um, a hybrid circuit and typically hybrid circuits are several inches by several inches. 
and uh, mimics uh, on the other hand are a few millimeters by few millimeters. There is a big difference in uh, performance and expectations between the two. So here we're just showing um, a 3D view uh, from Microwave Office showing an X-band uh, 1 watt amplifier. And here is um, just the schematic view of that and the top layout. Um, the tools that people uh, typically use are either Microwave Office uh, or ADS uh, are, are the most popular tools. Uh, and they have a full set of um, tools to help you complete uh, a mimic design. So when it comes to advantages, typically, as we mentioned, the um, mimics are much smaller. We're talking about few millimeters by few millimeters. And so if size or weight uh, is an issue, then a mimic solution is a much better approach than a hybrid uh, circuit. The other thing to consider is that if you're producing large quantities, then the mimics can be very inexpensive. Uh, for example, uh, in gallium arsenide, you could have a range price for the uh, millimeter between a quarter and 50 cents. Uh, of course, it depends on the complexity of the gallium arsenide process that is chosen. Um, for gallium nitride, we have the ranges um, higher. It's much more expensive than um, gas. And for indium phosphide, it's also expensive. Um, and in addition, after we um, consider the cost of the mimic itself, we need to think about how it's going to be assembled, um, the um, uh, housing, and all of these things are added um, as part of the cost. So uh, when we build a mimic first, we um, have uh, a mask set. And typically, the mask set and the um, fab run is this upfront cost can be significant. And so here I listed between 70,000 and 300,000 uh, for the initial run. Depending on whether you are doing uh, gallium arsenide, it would be towards the less expensive um, um, range. Or uh, gallium nitride or indium phosphide, then it would be closer to the higher end of this scale. But then once the mass cost is factored in, then each additional wafer is um, just a small increment. And so for perhaps gallium arsenide, we're talking about five to $10,000 uh, per wafer. And for gallium nitride, closer to 30,000. And in the way, when the wafers are run, uh, no one, nobody runs one wafer. So usually it's a lot. And the lot might have six wafers, 10 wafers, depending on um, the numbers required. But the traditional measure of uh, you know, price per millimeter or dollar per millimeter may not be the most accurate all the time. For example, uh, when we're talking about uh, power amplifiers, we may be thinking about the price per watt um, as a more useful measure. Because the um, gallium nitride um, is much more expensive, However, the power density is much higher, and so in, the, in a much smaller area, we'll be able to get the same power level um, that we are after. And so perhaps the uh, generic uh, price per millimeter is good as a ballpark, but then when we consider a specific component, we need to think about the uh, quantity that matters for us. The price um, that we end up uh, for the chip uh, depends um, very much on the size of the wafer that is used. And so here I have listed the um, wafer size or like the wafer area for a 3 inch, 4 inch, 6 inch, and you can extrapolate that to 8 inch and 12 inch and so on. And then how many millimeters squared uh, are in there? And so if you assume that you have 85% usable area, and that the price of wafer, each wafer is $6,000, you can quickly calculate uh, how much does it cost per millimeter. And you can see that as you go from three inch uh, wafers, let's say to six inch wafers, the price, so you, you double the um, um, diameter, the price 
doesn't just get cut by half it gets cut by much more than half because you know um, as you double the diameter the um, area is going to be the square of that and the reason that we have 85 percent of the area is uh, usable and the rest of it may not be if you look at the wafer picture that we have you find that usually um, we divide the uh, wafer into squares or rectangles and each rectangle is called a reticle and so that's the area that we can use and since the wafer is uh, circular towards the edges we will not be able to use the incomplete uh, rectangles so typically we may have 15 percent of the um, area of the wafer that is going to be essentially wasted and if we assume that uh, of the circuits that we build uh, that we get 90 percent yield um, then we can estimate the price of a chip which is 4 by 5 uh, millimeter squared. So here it might come out to be $33 if you're running it on a 3 inch process versus $20 for a 4 inch or $9 for um, a 6 uh, inch wafer. Uh, a lot of the gallium nitride processes at this point are um, closer to 4 inch and some are 6 inch. For gallium uh, arsenide, uh, we have 6 inch and even more. And as you know, for silicon, uh, we have much larger size, which is one of the big factors that's making the silicon uh, more affordable uh, in large quantities. Um, testing and assembly are additional, and um, they can be automated and done um, with relatively low cost uh, per chip. Uh, the MIMIC offers several advantages over um, the um, uh, hybrid uh, solution. The first most obvious one is the size. It's much smaller and it's much lighter. But another factor is the reliability uh, because there are just less variables. It's one integrated piece and it either works and meets the specs or it doesn't. Uh, when it comes to hybrids, uh, we're assembling parts from every which direction and uh, we need to monitor the reliability of so many different parts and uh, that may be more difficult. And also um, the reproducibility uh, for MIMIC is much better. Once it works, the process is uh, mature, we'll continue to get the same performance and it's not going to depend on which assembler is doing the assembly and uh, variations in the component values which are typically much larger than if you have uh, a mimic process that also um, we also can get broader bandwidth because instead of having the transistor with long bond wires that are going to take us around the Smith chart into high Q areas we are able to have very short connections and we're very close to the transistor we're able to control um, the matching networks so that we stay in um, low Q areas and um, we'll be able to get much bigger bandwidth. And so typically you will not find um, a hybrid circuit that gives you enormous bandwidth, but you will find mimics, as you will see examples of that shortly, that give you enormous bandwidth and good performance. Um, and again, it's lower cost and volume and you get more design flexibility since you're able to um, change the size of the transistor, uh, the width, the um, um, you know spacing and so on. The disadvantage is that you get higher transmission line losses and we'll talk about uh, that a little bit more but um, you get the higher losses because of two reasons. First the substrate is thinner typically four mils or two mils and the line widths are roughly on the order of the same um, height as the uh, substrate and so they're much narrower so this increases the loss and in addition they are thinner um, the um, on a printed circuit board we get thicker um, conductors and another disadvantage is that it's difficult to do any tuning because um, we're not able to remove resistors or capacitors and so on and because it's smaller you get some undesired RF coupling and you have a uh, higher cost for equipment and you also get limited component values because you're not able to reduce the loss significantly of transmission lines and so your cues are typically less 
you cannot implement huge transist uh, huge inductors or huge capacitors so that limits the values that you are able to get um, the hybrid uh, circuits uh, are inexpensive uh, they can be repaired they have lower transmission line losses higher Q's their disadvantages are is that um, the reliability is far less their bandwidth is less they also have uncontrolled parasitics and they are large um, and assembling them costs much more money uh, than um, you know a mimic where it's just one part and we put um, um, bond wires on it if you look at the frequency band and especially right now with the push uh, for 5g collision avoidance satellite communications a lot of the military specs and so on we're really moving into the millimeter wave into the higher frequencies and for the most part it's difficult uh, to do any of this on a hybrid circuit uh, once we cross perhaps 18 gigahertz or 20 gigahertz it becomes exceedingly difficult uh, to get um, a printed um, circuit board uh, and install components on it because a the assembly is going to be extremely difficult and even most of the components uh, inductors and capacitors are not going to work uh, in that range the meaning that chip inductors and chip capacitors so when it comes to device technologies here I listed some of the major device technologies um, gallium arsenide because it's been around for a long time there are so many variations of it there is the MESFET which is the older technology PHEMT which is more used at this point MHEMT an advanced uh, version of gallium arsenide and um, bipolar transistors the newer um, semiconductors gallium nitride um, is showing incredible promise and in many cases is replacing gallium arsenide indium phosphide is a mature technology and offers uh, incredible uh, speeds uh, silicon of course um, is still very strong and it offers high speed uh, through silicon germanium um, and uh, pure um, CMOS uh, processes so just a quick word on the different uh, varieties so the gas PHEMT has been uh, is, is really like the industry workhorse at this point it's the least expensive uh, it offers good performance uh, very mature uh, and so on typically the power densities we get out of gallium arsenide is perhaps you know limited to half a watt per millimeter and uh, the linearity that we get from the PHEMT is usually less than the MESFET that's why some of the old MESFET processes uh, are still around because they offer uh, you know nicer linearity than the PHEMT a disadvantage of gas is that it needs um, a negative voltage on the gate and in many of the commercial applications where cost is a huge issue uh, you know we're not interested in having another negative uh, you know voltage in the circuit and there are many uh, foundries that offer um, gallium arsenide uh, you know Corvo being one of the large ones uh, wind semiconductor so between wind semiconductor and Corvo they have the majority of the market and then you get the uh, high performance um, specialty type gallium arsenide uh, processes like with Northrop Grumman uh, Raytheon and so on uh, may come for certain defense uh, uh, industries and so on for gallium arsenide m -hemt, the m um, it's kind of cheating to say that it's gallium arsenide because it's essentially indium phosphide grown on gallium arsenide so it's an attempt to lower the cost of uh, indium phosphide by growing it on, an, on a less expensive uh, substrate and it offers of course you know extremely low noise figure because of the uh, incredible gain it has and the F max can go into the uh, 100 gigahertz region the disadvantage is that the breakdown voltage is low and um, that means that we cannot handle very high power and we still need uh, the negative supply the gallium arsenide uh, bipolar transistor um, 
is an extremely popular process, except especially for uh, many of the cell phone front ends, because the power density that we have um, is very significant, uh, you know, and so it, it's an, a very economical process uh, to use. It has some drawbacks. Uh, for example, the, we don't get very good um, isolation between the input and the output, which makes it more difficult in the design. Um, also, we ne may need to put um, resistors on the emitter to stabilize the circuit and prevent uh, maybe thermal runaway problems. Um, and again, you know, there are many foundries that offer um, this um, uh, process. <coughs> Gallium nitride, on the other hand, um, is uh, very high power. Um, it can um, reach um, high temperature and still perform excellent. And at this point, many um, foundries offer it, and it's quickly replacing um, gallium arsenide. Indium phosphide, as I mentioned, is very high uh, in speed um, and offers some of the best noise figures that uh, we can get out of any mature technology. This graph here, uh, borrowed from um, Dan Green, shows um, the saturated power versus frequency that people were able to obtain. And the green dots here represent indium phosphide, the red ones represent gallium nitride. Um, and then you also have the gallium arsenide um, as the um, black uh, circles. And you can see that the very high frequency is dominated by indium phosphide, and then the very high power, but lower frequency, is dominated by gallium nitride. Uh, this chart doesn't show the cost, but typically gallium nitride and indium phosphide are more expensive. So here I'm going to show just two quick examples of mimics, uh, very impressive examples. Um, this mimic covers 16 to 40 gigahertz, puts out uh, more than 10 watts across you know, the entire band, and has uh, far added efficiencies um, between 10 and, and 20 percent. So you can see what can be done with um, a nice gallium nitride process. Here is another example. Uh, this one is from uh, BAE, and uh, again, you can get you know roughly 17 to 40 gigahertz with uh, 10 to 18 watts uh, and 13 to 17 percent for added efficiency with excellent gain. And you can see that the uniform uniformity is excellent. And so, from one part to the next, you're able to uh, reliably get the performance. Next, we'd like to talk about um, active device modeling. So we'll uh, mention why do we model things in the first place. So first, what's a model? A model is typically an, in, um, an equivalent circuit or a set of equations that are going to predict the measured um, device. And the reason we do that is that we're not able to measure all the device sizes that we are after. So oftentimes we're, um, we do the modeling so that we're able to do scaling of the device. In many cases, we would like to use a large transistor to get uh, the output power, but it's difficult to measure, so we'd measure a smaller transistor, model it, and then scale up. Um, and also we may need to uh, change the layout of the transistor. And so modeling is important uh, when we're designing MIMICS because we have full control over um, how the uh, the layout of the transistor. And when it comes to modeling, we have two options. We can do small signal modeling or large signal modeling. Um, for small signal modeling, um, this is fairly easy. Any individual designer is able to do it, and it helps you with um, linear designs or mainly linear designs. So it's good for low noise amplifiers, um, class A, um, phase shifters, attenuators, things of this sort. And the um, errors that we will get are limited. I, you know, we're able to build a pretty good model that's reliable. The disadvantage is that, strictly speaking, it's valid only at one bias point. Uh, so it doesn't examine what happens in the rest of the um, different biases um, and does not predict output power or efficiency.
large signal modeling, on the other hand, uh, takes into account the specific voltage and current that uh, we are biased at and gives you a much more realistic uh, view of the power, um, the efficiency, um, nonlinearities of the transistor. However, because it's trying to cover such wide range of um, you know, um, regions of operation, it's not as accurate at any one point as the uh, small signal model. And so um, it, it has its benefits, but also in some senses it, it has its limitations. It's also much more expensive to build a, a large signal model, and typically an individual designer is not able to do that um, because it requires significant amount of measurements, um, specialized software. It, it requires a lot of um, expertise to develop a large signal model. So we'll talk quickly about the small signal model because um, this is easy and uh, everyone can um, develop it. And uh, just quickly, uh, so it starts with an equivalent circuit, and here I'm showing a standard equivalent circuit. And uh, one of the pitfalls, uh, so in the beginning, um, you would put some default values and uh, try to optimize. Uh, so this is after the optimization. You can see that the um, CAD tool was able to match S21 very well and S11. But you notice that the other values like S12 and S22, it had a much poorer um, match. And the reason is that the when you do the um, default optimization, it just looks at the magnitude and it tries to um, you know match to get the lowest error um, in absolute terms. So all the things that are small, like S12, uh, are just going to be like um, you know insignificant compared to any small deviation in S21. And so the optimizer will just focus on the large numbers like S21 and S11. If on the other hand, uh, you give it unequal weights so that you weigh all the S parameters equally, so let's say if S12 is you know, 20 dB lower, then you give it, you know, a weight of 20 dB higher so that the optimizer doesn't ignore it. And then you can see that the uh, fit becomes much better. But still, it's not perfect. You can see that S22 is not lining up as well as we would like it to. And so, if you take into account the uh, feeding structure, so here we have the gate uh, colored green and the uh, drain colored yellow, that if you were to EM this piece and put the manifold and all of the transmission lines as part of it and then re-optimize, you'll find that you're able to nail it and just have an excellent um, small signal model that takes into account all of the details of the transistor. This um, graph here is um, from <coughs> Don Levy um, from Modelithics and shows their process for uh, extracting a large signal model. And as you can see, it requires a lot of characterization, uh, a lot of parameter extraction, model validation, measurements, um, well, whether pulsed RF, time domain measurements, uh, load pool measurements. And so getting a large signal uh, <coughs> uh, equivalent uh, circuit is not um, trivial. Um, and you can characterize the speed of the transistor using FT or Fmax, the cutoff frequency, or uh, Fmax, which is the frequency at which you get um, power gain of 1. Quickly, we'll talk about the uh, lifetime uh, of uh, MIMICS. And the important thing to know is uh, what's called the Arrhenius plot. Um, so in here on the y-axis you see the expected lifetime of the part and on the x-axis you see 1000 divided by the temperature in Kelvin. And so for example the uh, 125 degree C is shown on the right and then what's shown on the left these three points are the uh, temperatures 285, 255 and 270. The important point to take from this graph is that the lifetime uh, depends exponentially on the temperature. And so if your transistor crosses the critical temperature, then its lifetime is going to change very, very rapidly. So 
let's say a gallium arsenide part at 150 degree C versus 200 degree C, that could mean the difference between a lifetime of you know 100 hours versus 10 years, uh, just these 50 degrees. And so it's very important to be aware and careful what is the junction temperature that the transistor has. And to calculate the junction temperature, there are some models that you can use. For example, here I'm showing um, equations for gallium arsenide, um, and it helps you by taking into account the um, gate spacing, the gate length, gate width, and so on, to plug it into these equations um, and give you uh, what's the thermal resistance. And for example, let's say the thermal resistance is 20 degrees C per watt. That means for every watt of dissipation, the junction temperature will go up by 20 degrees. And so the more efficient you make an amplifier, the more life it will have. Um, and here is uh, another slide for the bipolar transistor. The equations are different, but still we're able to predict accurately what is the um, temperature rise across the chip. The last two slides were just considering the um, temperature rise within the chip. But typically, you also need to think about the die attached. Do you have epoxy below it? Do you have eutectic, and so on? And if you would like to be accurate, so you would need to consider um, the die attached because the temperature rise across the epoxy is significant. And so here this uh, slide shows for gallium nitride um, this calculation. And in addition, um, it shows how would you take the uh, nonlinearity of the um, thermal conductivity into account. And this is especially important uh, for um, devices that will have significant power. So for example, if you look at the graphs here, uh, and you look at the channel temperature uh, on the left, uh, and the dissipated power. Um, this is for um, gallium nitride on silicon, the blue line, and gallium nitride on silicon carbide. So if you look at the um, lines, you'll find that the dotted line is the uh, linear prediction, the one that assumes that the thermal conductivity doesn't change with temperature. And then the dashed line is the one that takes into account the change in um, thermal conductivity as you heat up the device. So if you look at, let's say, 5 uh, watts per millimeter, you see quite a significant difference between the blue line, the dashed line, and the dotted line. So any time you're dissipating large amounts of power, you absolutely need to consider the uh, nonlinearity of the thermal conductivity, and you cannot really just go with uh, the simplistic uh, equations that pretend that it's um, linear. Uh, on the right, um, you see um, theory versus experiment for some of the equations uh, that you just saw earlier. Now we'll quickly talk about um, resistors and um, current uh, limits. In the MIMIC process, you usually have two types of resistors, uh, thin film um, type resistors and uh, substrate resistors. So the upper one we're seeing here is just a thin film resistor. And uh, typically, this is done with tantalum nitride or nichrome. And the substrate resistor is not really a physical material that you put. You just use the uh, epistructure or the uh, electron gas. Uh, which is built into the substrate uh, to use it as a resistance uh, value. Each one has its advantages and disadvantages. For the um, resistors in general, we evaluate the resistance uh, by looking at how many squares we have. Uh, and so uh, we just uh, take the uh, resistance as, um, you know, uh, we look at the width and the length. And so a 20 by 20 micron uh, square will have the same resistance as 100 by 100. Of course, even though they have the same resistance, they have different ability to uh, handle power. The larger trend, um, resistor will be able to handle the power much more than the smaller resistor. And that's an important point that I'm going to get into next, which is current limits. Um, and this is something that is critical when designing MIMICS.
for the thin film resistors, um, as I said, we typically have two types uh, of um, materials that get deposited, either nichrome or tantalum nitride. And the foundry would design the um, resistance per square to be 20 or 50 ohms. But one thing to notice is what is the um, current limit uh, for the uh, resistors? It's about half a milliamp per micron. And so if we have uh, the width equal to, say, um, 10 microns uh, for the resistor, then we're able to handle 5 milliamps across it. Sometimes people uh, may mistakenly say, well, I'm not passing any DC through it. I'm just passing RF through it. Well, the RF uh, also has um, uh, a root mean square uh, value. So the RMS value of the current at the resistor is going to result in heat. And that heat is going to uh, damage it if it exceeds uh, the safe limit. And so oftentimes resistors are a big point of failure uh, because the designer did not consider how much power could possibly be dumped in it uh, before it fails. For example, if you have a Wilkinson divider or combiner and you have two power amplifiers, um, if the amplifiers are not exactly matched, any imbalance between the two will be dumped in the um, isolation resistor. And so that isolation resistor, if we're talking about a large uh, power like we're looking at uh, these mimics that put out 10 watts. Um, so if there is um, any um, you know, imbalance between them, we could dump as much as one watt into that resistor. And so it needs to be a beefy resistor uh, to be able to handle this much uh, power. Resistors that are um, based on the substrate typically can handle much more power but their disadvantage is that their value is not so constant with temperature. So as you change the temperature, their value is going to change. So they're usually just good for decoupling, not so much for specific values of resistance. Current limit is an important issue uh, because when you do printed circuit board, that's not a big consideration. Um, when you do printed circuit board, let's say you use an ounce of copper. Well, an ounce of copper is like 35 microns thick. And so typically you don't run into current limitations even for narrow lines. But for uh, mimics, and I'm showing here the uh, picture of uh, an inductor. So the inductor, as it goes, um, the uh, metal goes under the air bridge, you're using only one layer of metal. And that one layer is usually the bottom metal and that bottom me metal can pass a limited amount of current, so maybe only 3 milliamps per micron. And so you find that to be able to sustain the amount of current that you need, um, you need the lines to be much wider. Because, you know, in, in the mimic uh, process, the thickness of the um, metals are just a few microns. And if you talk about the bottom uh, metal, it may be limited to even less than one micron of thickness. And so current handling uh, limitations for conductors on mimics is something really that's important, uh, especially for power circuits. The last topic we'll talk about is uh, blocking unwanted oscillations. And the reason that this is critical for mimic is that you cannot go back in and, and tune it. You cannot go in and change a resistor or a capacitor and make it stable. Um, if it oscillates, um, anywhere close to your band, you have to go through the whole cycle again, pay hundreds of thousands of dollars for another run, and wait for perhaps for another six months. So the typical um, stability um, measures that people use are the K and delta. And both of these quantities, <coughs> once you satisfy them, you ensure that the um, input reflection coefficient is less than one for all possible loads and the output reflection coefficient is better than one for all possible loads. A lot of researchers have shown many limitations that are not captured <coughs> by the K-delta test. For example, one of them is that the K-delta test is, requires that you check two parameters, K and delta, and they are not proportional. So it's not necessary that if, you know, delta is, you know, much, you know, further into the safe zone that the 
trans that the amplifier is more stable. So there are alternatives. For example, the mu test. Uh, it's a single parameter test. You don't have two parameters to check, and it gives you a measure uh, that uh, you know tells you how far into stability you are. And there is an excellent paper that I have listed here uh, by Jackson that discusses all the different um, possibilities that people have used. Because if you look in the literature, you'll find in addition to the K delta test, you'll find the K and B1 test, so many different variations. But he shows that for the most part, they're all equivalent. Just use one of the tests and use it consistently, you'll get the same result. And it tells you the pros and cons of each type of test. Uh, the mu test is um, one of the nice ones, and all of the CAT tools uh, integrated uh, have it um, in the, as part of it, the analysis. One of the um, points that is sometimes um, neglected um, is, but it can cause instability, is um, the odd mode oscillation. So if you have two um, transistors in parallel, um, the K delta test or the mu test is considering that the input signal will split equally and that both transistors are in phase. They're driven in phase, their output is in phase, and so on. But another scenario for their operation could be that they operate like a seesaw, that when one of them is on the peak, the other one is at the bottom of the sine wave. And uh, this scenario uh, happens when the signal, or when this scenario happens, the common nodes appear as virtual grounds. And so if you put a resistor between the two, like uh, R opt, the R opt that we see here, then if they begin to go out of phase, then this resistor would dissipate that energy, which is the odd mode oscillation. Oftentimes, the odd mode oscillation is difficult to detect because the K delta doesn't show it, the mu doesn't show it, uh, but in the literature, people were able to develop some tests that um, can detect it. Uh, for example, the test that um, you see here, where you break the circuit um, at a common um, reference plane, and then uh, you consider the circuit to the left, which is the two transistors, consider it as a two-port network and then the circuit on the right, consider it as a two-port network. And then you can calculate the input odd impedance, ZIO, and you can calculate ZOO, which is the output odd impedance. And so um, you can see the calculation that ZIO equals Z11I uh, for the input and minus Z21I, uh, again, for the circuit on the left. And you can do the same thing for ZOO. And the condition for oscillation is going to happen, uh, or you have the potential for oscillation, any time that the sum of the odd resistances, um, the real part, um, is negative. And the imaginary part is equal to 0. So after this paper was published, um, it, it was very well received. Others quickly pointed out that it's not enough to check the impedance. You also need to check the admittance because you want to ensure that the real part of the admittance, which is basically the conductance, sums up to a number that's higher than zero because if it's less than zero, you again, you could trigger an oscillation. So that's just one way to uh, check for the odd uh, os uh, mode oscillation. Oftentimes, also, you find that oscillations happen um, by the way that um, they're, they're sensitive to the bias uh, network. And at low frequency, the, uh, a lot of the transmission lines are going to seem like a short circuit, and your mimic or your amplifier is going to be sensing the outside world. And so it begins to sense the um, bias network, and if the bias network presents um, the wrong impedance, you have the potential for oscillation. And so to handle that, um, one way to detect it um, is actually to do a three-port stability test. And so the reference I have here at the bottom um, show you how some of the tests that can help you look at a three-port network stability. 
wherein you would have the input and output RF, and then you would add one of the bias ports, uh, the DC ports, um, to look at. Um, generally, it's a good idea that um, you shield the bias lines uh, from, so that you have shielded bias lines. So instead of coming with a long wire or a long bond wire, if you can have a ground that's next to it so that um, it, in terms of RF, it looks like um, a decent impedance instead of looking like an open or a complete short or a resonance, that would help. Also, it's useful to tie um, a large uh, capacitor, of course, depending on the design that you have, very, very close so that the circuit sees uh, a true RF ground uh, and is not able to leak um, outside of the mimic. The, um, in general, you get oscillations uh, if three things happen. The real, so for example, if you have a series um, uh, circuit like you see here, if the real part of the uh, impedance is negative, if the imaginary part, the reactive part, sums to zero, and the slope of the reactance um, is positive. And the same thing can be done, uh, said about the admittance, if we're talking about a parallel resonance. This, these are uh, equations that are sufficient for an oscillation to happen and to be a sustained oscillation. Generally, we don't want to get to the point where all the um, conditions are satisfied, so we would like to um, violate the first condition, meaning that we'd like to have a resistance greater than zero and a conductance that's greater than zero. So, um, in closing, um, I'm just showing here an example of the different um, of the different semiconductors, um, their band gap, and uh, mobilities and thermal conductivities. Just to highlight that uh, in this table you see diamond, and you see that diamond has uh, an incredible thermal conductivity, the row before the last, and it's one of the semiconductors that people are excited about if it ever works, and some groups are pursuing it. And so in closing, uh, the MIMIC uh, process offers you certain advantages over hybrid, uh, but you need to do a careful modeling and consider the temperature um, that uh, the junction will get to and block unwanted oscillations. And I will stop here. I would like to thank you for your attention. Great. Thanks, thanks a lot, Ali. Uh, excellent presentation. Um, and I, I know it's a very interesting subject and uh, uh, look forward to hearing uh, more about this in, in, in our Q&A session here. So, so now it is time for our question and answer session. <clears throat> Before we start, please remember that you can still submit questions through the Q&A panel. Uh, but right now we'll, we will, uh, we'll take our first question here. So the first question is, can you comment on how the PAE of the GAN PAs change if one substantially lowers the output power? That's an excellent question. Uh, when you lower the uh, output power, uh, typically uh, your power added efficiency uh, drops, but it depends on how it drops. So in class A, it drops very, very quickly. Um, it's just you follow like a quadratic line. Uh, in class B, it drops more linearly, so it's a bit more decent. Um, than class A. Uh, if you go to um, more interesting amplifiers like the Doherty amplifier, uh, you're able to keep the uh, power added efficiency at a good value even at 6 uh, dB back off uh, or even uh, larger uh, depending on if you have two-way Doherty or three-way Doherty and so on. Um, also for um, switching uh, type power amplifiers, um, Oftentimes, people are able to change the output power uh, by just changing the um, uh, drain voltage, the supply voltage. And so this way, you're able to get lower power um, and keep the power added efficiency. But of course, that requires that you um, have a supply where you can change the voltage efficiently. And that's a subject of uh, research um, in the community. Wonderful. Okay, so uh, this next question is in regards to uh, the, the temperature modeling. Uh, 
<clears throat> and the question is, what tool did you use to get the junction temperature? Or, or can you make some comments about uh, useful tools to, uh, to accomplish this? So uh, good question. Um, so the temperature, to calculate the temperature, um, you can e either use the set of equations uh, I showed. And uh, in the papers, I show several examples of how to use them to make sure that uh, they're used correctly and that you're able to evaluate um, the different thermal resistances. Uh, or you could use um, um, a numerical solver. Um, there are several CAD packages um, that um, do um, finite element modeling, for example, ANSYS, uh, even HFSS. And some of them, uh, some of these tools integrate with the um, ADS and with Microwave Office such that it would take from your layout um, the um, structure and begin to analyze the thermal picture. But the EM, uh, but the numerical solution uh, takes much longer um, to find out the temperature. Okay, great. Uh, here's a question about stability. So the comment or the question is: K and delta stability test or the mu test is only for linear operating modes. How do you propose to check the the stability of the mimic in nonlinear regimes? Okay, that's also an excellent question. Um, yes, the K and delta test and the mu test uh, only check the um, linear stability. It does not check the nonlinear stability or parametric uh, amplification. Um, there are some. Um, there is this is an area of research, and um, there is a tool out there. Um, I think it's called the Stan tool that helps you in checking out the um, nonlinear instability. But honestly, um, I expect that this area is going to remain an open wound for the microwave community, because the proper way to deal with instability is to do time domain analysis. And in most cases, we don't have the time, a good time domain model, and we're just using uh, frequency domain uh, analysis. Or think about it as the Fourier transform that suppresses all the transients uh, that could happen. And the proper thing would have been to use the Laplace transform. But unfortunately, we're not measuring our components, um, you know, or characterizing the transfer function as a Laplace transfer function. It's more like a Fourier transfer function. And so um, there is the work um, uh, for the, uh, for example, there is the NDF, uh, which is a non-determinant um, function. And there's something called um, the return difference uh, and the return ratio. So several papers were published on this issue. Um, it's still not like a, a, an, e an easy issue where, you know, someone would just say, OK, take this parameter, look for it, and then it will solve all of your problems. It requires more attention than that. OK, and I believe that answers one of our other questions that, uh, that was where the question is referring to odd mode oscillations uh, that are hidden in harmonic balance simulations, but transient simulations may, may pick these up. You've got yeah, the actually, on this issue, so w one um, um, way, uh, and this is uh, outlined uh, in the book by um, Almudina Suarez. Um, and she's one of the people who is responsible for creating the stand tool, is that you would put like a test voltage source that would perturb this, the circuit at a, uh, at a node. And while the RF is going through at, you know, it's driven into a large signal analysis, this perturbation tool is going to sweep all frequencies with a voltage and, uh, and current in order to measure the um, impedance and admittance under drive. And if it finds that it becomes negative at any frequency, so let's say you're driving at you know, 1 gigahertz, but that could trigger uh, an instability at you know, half a gigahertz uh, or uh, some other place. And so uh, this test would pick it up. And that's outlined in her book how to do that. OK. OK, great. Uh, so we have a question here about um, modeling of MIMIC components for, uh, uh, for inductors and capacitors. And the question is, uh, in some cases, we see large discrepancies between model-based simulations and EM simulation results. 
and that's especially true for spiral inductors. Are there reasons behind this, and which one should they trust? Oh, well, you should trust the EM simulation. You shouldn't trust the um, schematic, um, you know, um, you know, equations that have equivalent circuits, because the equivalent circuits um, are just trying to characterize, um, you know, the let's say the parallel capacitance and so on. But it doesn't take into, and it's trying to do this generically. So let's say at low frequency. But as you get to higher frequencies, all kinds of effects happen. So instead of the current just traveling down the center of the microstrip, it goes to the edges of the microstrip. And so it appears as if it's, you know, two lines that are moving together and they couple differently. And so the EM simulator captures all of that. And that's why it's quite difficult to find a simplistic equivalent circuit that would do a good job at high frequency for any of the um, rectangular inductors. Great. Uh, here's a question that I, I uh, will try to rephrase just a little bit. Um, it, so the mimics you showed appear to use microstrip transmission lines. How common are coplanar waveguide transmission lines? Uh, in general, what are the preferred means of moving signals around on, on, the, on mimics? OK, this is a very nice question as well, um, the, to use microstrip versus coplanar. Um, if you look at the loss uh, equations, you will find that the closer the ground, the higher the loss will be. And so for the coplanar, the uh, ground is very close. And so typically, you'll get higher losses as you propagate. Um, of course, the advantage is if you need to reach ground, you'll have very small inductance, right? And yeah. so um, if you have a thick substrate, like in many cases when people use uh, silicon or silicon germanium, they don't thin the substrate. And so you don't have the ability to put metal on the back and have a microstrip because the substrate is so thick. You're going to get multi-mode behavior. And so oftentimes, whenever people are able to use microstrip, they use microstrip because usually it would give you lower loss um, than coplanar. But if you have a thick substrate that you're unable to thin, then you just um, live with the coplanar um, with the higher losses. Interesting. <clears throat> okay, so here we'll have uh, our last question, um, and uh, let me see if you can answer this. So can you comment on the differences in radiation hardness between GAN, gas, and indium phosphide technologies? A uh, question on radiation hardness between GAN, gas, and indium phosphide. I'm not really um, familiar with this area. Um, I would expect that gallium nitride is much more radiation hardened just because the band gap for it is much larger than gallium arsenide. And of course, gallium arsenide has a bigger band gap than indium phosphide. You can see that reflected in the bias voltage. So typically, you would get better rad hard behavior uh, for GAN and then gas and then indium phosphide. But this is just a wild guess. I, I have not really looked into this issue in any detail. OK, that's why I was just throwing that out there as a the last question. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, I'm afraid we're out of time here. We do still have a number of questions in the queue, and the presenter will follow up on those unanswered questions offline. As we said earlier, this session will be archived on the Society website at mtt.org. All registrants will get an email reminder with a website address when it's available. Uh, for attendees that would, like, that would like to receive PDH credits, please follow the link in the webcast view and use the code provided on the last slide of this presentation, the slide that's shown right now. And uh, finally, once again, I'd like to thank Dr. Darwish for an excellent presentation on a really interesting uh, topic. Our thanks also go out to National Instruments, who is the sponsor for this webinar, and a special thanks to our audience for joining us today. We hope you found today's event valuable and that you return for future IEEE MTT Society webcasts. Thank you, and have a good day.